We are continuing this morning the series that we just started a few weeks back called Unsinkable, right? And uh, hopefully through the series, uh, you've been learning some truths. Uh, we've, we've been talking about and comparing it to an iceberg, right? And saying that most of the mass of the iceberg is underwater. And we as Christians need to have these truths underneath us to keep us afloat and to make us unsinkable. And the first Sunday, Pastor Brian taught us the fact that there is truth. There's actually absolute truth, and it's the Word of God, right? And we illustrated that by the story of the Titanic. And we, we saw how the people that made the Titanic, the builders, the engineers, the crew members, everybody had their own truth. Their truth was very simple. Our ship is unsinkable. That was their truth. And they believed that so much that out of 2,200 people they had in the boat, they only had life vests and lifeboats for a third of that, for 700 people. Well, of course, if your truth is that the boat is unsinkable, why do you need life vests? Right? Why do you need lifeboats? Why carry the excess weight if we know the ship is unsinkable? And so they did that. But as you and I know, as we all know, an iceberg destroyed their truth. And, and I think many of us, we can go through life with our own truth. And we can make decisions based on our own truth. We can treat other people based on our own truth. And let me tell you, sooner or later, someone or something is going to come along and is going to challenge your truth. And if that truth is not in solid ground, you're going to sink. You're going to sink. So it's important for us to understand that there is truth. It's called the Word of God. And that that truth is solid. It's absolute and it's unsinkable. It's an unsinkable truth. Now, the second week, we spoke about the reality that this truth reveals to us, and that is that there is only one God. Right? There is only one God. And I'm sure you saw in, in Acts chapter 17, Pastor Brad described it probably a little bit different than I did. But we saw there that Paul describes this God to the Athenians as God the creator, as a sovereign God, and as a redeeming God. And I, you probably saw the illustration in Isaiah 6, chapter 1, where Isaiah, even though everything is going out of control in his world, he saw God on the throne. He saw God in control, right? And we know that no matter what's happening in our lives, no matter what situation we're going through, no matter what's going on in this world, we know that God is seated on the throne. He is sovereign. Everything is under his control. Amen? So we got these two truths that, that we have today in our lives. And we know that the word of God is truth. There is absolute truth. And there is one God. Okay. But now today we're going to look at a passage in John chapter 3. And we're going to see a, a character that is all in in religion. As a matter of fact, this man believed those truths. He believed in the word of God. That Back in those days it was the Old Testament. And he believed that there was only one God. But he also knew that there was something missing, that that wasn't enough. So we're going to look at his story here in chapter 3 of, first of the book of John. Uh, his name is Nicodemus, and in the first verse, John tells us right away who he is. And it says like this. It says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus and a ruler of the Jews. Let's stop there for a minute because we need to look at this very closely. This is very important for us to understand the context of what we're learning this morning. Nicodemus, like it says there, he was a Pharisee, and he was a leader or ruler of the Jews. Okay? Nicodemus was a member of what is called the Sanhedrin. Okay? And this was a group of 70 guys, mostly Pharisees. Okay? But imagine this. You've got millions and millions of people in this country. Only 70 people are qualified to be in this group. And Nicodemus was one of them. This is pretty smart people, okay? If, if there was ever a group that you can call a religious fanatic, it was this group, okay? They were very smart. They had a lot of knowledge, uh, and they had complete uh, authority, religious authority over every Jew anywhere in the world. So whatever they said, that, that went. That was it. It was the Sanhedrin. Now, Nicodemus was part of the Pharisees, and that was a larger group. The Pharisees was about 6,000 men, and each one of them took a solemn vow before three witnesses 
to devote every moment of their life, listen to this, every moment of their life to obeying the Ten Commandments as a way of pleasing God. Now, think about that for a second, okay? Because we sometimes read these things and they go like, and they don't make sense to us. But imagine yourself making a full commitment today to live every single moment of your life to obey the Word of God. We will take like 10 minutes to be out of that one, right? But these people took this very seriously. They did it before three witnesses. They took it very seriously. They took it so seriously that grew up, there grew up a group right uh, between them called the, the scribes whose sole purpose was to study each commandment and, and show how to apply it to everyday life. Okay, so, so you have the Pharisees, 6,000 of them, but from them grows up this group called the scribes, and all they do is study these Ten Commandments and tell you how to apply it. How serious was this? They develop a book called the Mishnah. And excuse my pronunciation if they're not correct. But for example, in the Mishnah, on just the commandment of not working on the Sabbath, they had 24 chapters. And you should not work on the Sabbath. Now, if you think that's impressive, from that group, they also created another book called the Talmud. Now, the Talmud was like a commentary on the Mishnah. So the Mishnah was a commentary on the Bible, and then the Talmud was a commentary on the Mishnah. And just on the Sabbath uh, commandment alone, there were 156 pages on the Talmud. So not only they had 24 chapters on the Mishnah, they had another 156 pages. And these people took this very seriously. They wanted to follow every single one of these commandments. And I'm telling you this. For one reason. I'm telling you this because Nicodemus did not come to Jesus that day saying, you know what? I'm a horrible person, Jesus, and I need to be saved. He didn't. He came to Jesus thinking that he was a pretty good person. He came to Jesus saying, you know what? I am the man. I'm a Pharisee. I'm a scribe. I know all the commandments. I follow them all my life. I'm a good person. But he knew something was missing. And maybe you come to Jesus that way, saying, you know what, God, I'm a pretty good person. You know, if you can only fill this little hole in my life, you know, maybe I'm just not a good husband. But everything else, I'm, I'm pretty good. People like me. I do good work. I'm a good person. But just if you can help me on being a good husband and, and kind of put that in there and, and fill the hole, I, I'll be good. Or, or maybe you come to God and say, you know what, God, I'm a good guy. I do everything perfect except, you know, I have, I have this addiction. So if you just take this addiction away and you cover my addiction, I, I'm good. I'm acceptable. Right? Many of us come to Jesus like that. And, and I think that's the way that Nicodemus came to Jesus. And, you know, Nicodemus understood that there was the word of God. He understood that there is only one God. And it says here in verse 2, it says, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with you. Now, now, let's look at that carefully again. Here we have the teacher of teachers, Nicodemus, right, calling Jesus, who is not a Pharisee, a rabbi. A rabbi means teacher. So <laughs> here's the teacher of teachers looking at Jesus and saying, I know you're a teacher. Hey, teacher, can you come here for a second? He acknowledges two things. First, that he's a teacher. Secondly, he acknowledges that Jesus is acceptable to God. Now, what are the Pharisees looking to get? They want to be acceptable to God. They want to follow all the rules of the Bible so they can be acceptable to God. And he is recognizing Jesus is acceptable to God. Why? Because he's doing all these signs and all these miracles. And because of that, I know he's acceptable. So Jesus, you know what, Jesus? If you can fill this hole for me and make me acceptable to God, I'm going to be fine. Because I'm a Pharisee. I'm the teacher of teachers. Right? This is interesting because they had a concept of teaching. Their, their idea was that what humanity needed in order to be better and to do right was good teachers. Think about that for a second. We have more teaching and more information now than we have ever had in our lifetime. Is humanity good? I'll let you answer that. But they, their thinking was an instructed mind and a committed will. All I need is information 
And I need to have a committed will to do it. That's all I need to be a good person. Okay? And this, my friends, this represents religiosity. This is religion. When I try to gain acceptance to God by what I do is religion. Some of us perhaps come to God like that. We think God is sitting up there on the throne and saying, you know what, when Jose fulfills the Ten Commandments, then I'll accept him. Or when Jose does better at being a husband, I'll accept him. That's religion. It ain't the, it's not the way it is. And sometimes we think that if we can do better, God, just help me on this area. I can do better. I can please you. And we're working so hard to please God. But listen to what Jesus tells Nicodemus. And, and, and again, this is important. Remember who Nicodemus is. He's the teacher of teachers. He's the Pharisee. He's the scribe. He knows it all. He knows the Old Testament left and right. He, he knows it. And look what Jesus says. Truly, truly. Now, every time you hear Jesus say, truly, truly, okay, he's basically saying something important is coming. Pay attention. He say, Nicodemus, wake up. Because I'm going to say something important. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What? That's what that would be my reaction. What? <laughs> after a lifetime of effort, after learning everything I've learned, after understanding, after obeying, after teaching the Word of God, you're going to tell me that i got to start all over again? What? Jesus looks at him and says, listen, Nicodemus, what you have tried to do all your life is in vain. It has no value to get you accepted into the kingdom of God. Can you imagine? I, 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 can, I have this picture in my mind. I mean, the surprise in Nicodemus' face. Saying, Nicodemus, you understand religion. Yeah, you understand the word, but you have missed the mark. So this brings me to our first point. That knowing the word of God is not enough for salvation. Knowing the word of God is not enough for salvation. I know many of you are going right now, oh, my goodness, what is he saying? Let me explain what I'm saying. Yes, first of all, the word of God is truth. We already learned that. It is absolute truth. Okay? John 17, 17 says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. The word of God is truth. Okay? But it was never meant to be used as a means to obtain, obtain saving grace. The word of God was never meant to be a means for me to obtain every grace. And what I mean is this. You can't read the word of God and be saved. Listen, there's professors in colleges in the United States teaching the word of God. And the, the professors are not saved. You can read the whole word of God. You can know it left and right. You can have read it ten times in your lifetime and not be saved. Because the word of God by itself cannot save you. Secondly, the Word of God is a tutor. The Word of God is really a tutor. Galatians 3.24 says, Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we may be justified by faith. It doesn't say justify by the Word. See that? It says justify by faith. You see, the Word of God, the purpose of the Word of God was to lead us. It was to teach us. It was to be our tutor, a schoolmaster, says the King James Version. It was to teach us and take us to whom? To Jesus, who by faith could give us justification. See, the Word of God is a tutor. Why? Because the Word of God is about Jesus. The whole Word of God is all about Jesus. Listen to what Jesus told the Pharisees. Just a couple of chapters after, in, in John chapter 5, verse 39, it says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. They were searching the scriptures. They were studying the scriptures to obtain what? To obtain eternal life. And Jesus says, but it is they that bear witness about me. They are supposed to take you to me. 
That's what the scriptures are there for. The word of God is there not to give us eternal life. The word of God bears witness of the one who can. See, understand this. We don't obey the word of God to obtain grace. We obey the word of God because we have obtained grace. Okay? Tim Keller said it this way in his book, The Prodigal Son. Religion operates on the principle of I obey, therefore I am accepted by God. The basic operating principle of the gospel is I am accepted by God through the work of Jesus Christ, therefore I obey. See the difference? It's a huge difference. Listen, just as Nicodemus found out, there is no possible way of entering the kingdom of God you can't even see it by human effort. Everything you do to try to be in grace with God will lead you to spiritual bankruptcy. Everything. There's nothing you can do. So Jesus tells Nicodemus here in verse 5 and 6, he says, look at the first word. Truly, truly. Hey, this is important, Nicodemus. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit... He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. See, he's using Old Testament terminology to explain to him that this is something spiritual, not physical. The flesh can only produce flesh. It doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. Your flesh can only produce flesh. Okay? Our best. The best we could do. And it's here exemplified by Nicodemus. He is the best. None of us are even close to how good Nicodemus was. Our best is like filthy rags before God. It's like filthy rags. All right, so we have that knowing the word of God, knowing and obeying the word of God is not enough for salvation, right? Right? But the second truth is that knowing that there's only one God is not enough for salvation either. Knowing that there's only one God is not enough for salvation. Nicodemus knew that there was only one God. As a matter of fact, he was so convinced of this truth that he did so to the point of dedicating his whole life to this one God. He committed his whole life to him. He represents the expert in all things related to God. That was Nicodemus. Yet with all his knowledge, with all his reading, with all his praying, with all his rule keeping, he came to Jesus because he must have known that there was something missing. He had to know. And how incredible it is to me, right, that the expert of the law, the one who had been studying the prophecies, the one who had been awaiting the Messiah, with all the studying, with all the praying, with all the knowledge, with all the teaching, he is face to face with the Messiah. He hears his words. He acknowledges that God is acceptable, that Jesus is acceptable to God. He acknowledges that. And with all of that, he missed him. Isn't that incredible? Dedicate your whole life to meet this one person. And when he's in front of you, you miss him? And they missed it so bad that the Pharisees later on were the same ones who killed him. They killed the one that they were waiting for. The one they've been studying all their life for. They just killed him. Listen, my friends, are you trying to please God by your efforts? Are you trying to know more and more and more of the word of God so you can please God, so he can be ex you can be acceptable to him? Are you frustrated already trying to do this? Because it is frustrating. We can see in this dialogue between Nicodemus and Jesus, Nicodemus' frustration. You can see it. Nicodemus kept asking, how can this be? How can I be born again? How can I be born of the Spirit? Jesus, I'm not understanding. I'm getting a little bit frustrated here. How can this be? And we can sense his frustration, right? But we can also sense Jesus' frustration. I, I think Jesus was frustrated with Nicodemus. Look at verse 10. He says, Nicodemus, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Really? 
You've been dedicating all your life and you don't understand what I'm talking about here? Truly, truly, there's the words again. <laughs> Nicodemus, wake up. I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? <laughs> No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus is frustrated with Nicodemus. He's looking at him and saying, man, I, I'm trying to explain this in human terms and you don't understand it, brother. If I went to the spiritual side, forget it, we're lost. He can't understand why Nicodemus' head is still in human things. And many of us are trying to do religion because our head is on human things. We're not looking above. And you cannot understand the things of the Spirit if you're trying to rationalize it with your human mind. It's foolishness, it says the word. It's foolishness. Jesus has been trying to explain that with the new birth, and he's been trying to explain that the new birth is a Spirit-directed act, not a human event. Jesus, who descended from heaven, he is. The witness. He's the clear witness to all things related to the kingdom of God. He knows better than nobody. And here he is giving testimony to Nicodemus, the teacher of teachers. And he can't understand it. Wow. The key, my friends, the key to knowing God personally, the key to obtaining a new birth, the key to belonging to the kingdom of God is looking to Jesus. The key is what we call the gospel. The gospel is the good news. See, without accepting the message of the gospel, you cannot earn your spot in the kingdom of heaven. And the gospel is very simple. It says that Jesus came, became man. God became man. He incarnated himself in Jesus. Jesus lived the perfect life. He died on the cross for, to pay the penalty of our sin. He was buried and he rose again. And now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. That is the gospel news for you. And all we need to do is accept it. You see, the third point in your out outline there is knowing Jesus is the only way of salvation. Knowing Jesus is the only way of salvation. And Jesus is trying to relay this message to Nicodemus. And he's getting frustrated with Nicodemus. He says, okay, buddy, you don't understand this thing. Let me, let me give it to you in a way you can understand. Let's go to your home ground, to your home turf. Let's go to the Old Testament. Let me give you a story of the Old Testament that for sure you will understand. And look at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Says Nicodemus, okay, let me give it to you this way. They're going to lift me up on a pole. And if you believe in me, you will have eternal life. Let me, let, let's read that story in Numbers chapter 21. Let's read that story. It's a short story. Let's read it so that we can see the context of what Jesus is telling Nicodemus here. It says in verse 4. From Mount Or, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around to the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe, we detest this worthless food. Do you know what food they're talking about? Manna. What? Here is God cooking up there, sending food down. Can, man, can you imagine if you tell this to your wife? I loathe this worthless food. I'll be calling Rome. Man, can I sleep over there tonight, brother? <laughs> they're talking like this about God's food. 
Then, of course, the Lord sent fiery serpents. My wife would have done worse. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses, of course, right, after they see their, their cousin dying. Come to Moses and said, we have sinned. No, really. We have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. Now notice this. They want God to take what away? The serpents. Hmm. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he will look at the bronze serpent and live. Now notice a few things with me. First of all, God didn't take the serpents away. Did you notice that? Because it said Moses made the serpent, and when somebody got bit, then they had to look up. So the serpents were still there. God didn't take him away. Okay? Notice with me that the people had sinned, right? The venom of the serpents was in them. And the consequences of their actions was what? Death. Right? If you had the venom in you, you would surely die. Not only physical death, but spiritual death because they had offended God. Now notice also with me that the solution to the problem was not within them. See, they couldn't boost their immune system and take care of the venom. They couldn't make a cup of tea of a certain herb or something and take care of the venom. The solution was not within them. As a matter of fact, they couldn't even quote the word of God to take care of the venom. They couldn't. What did they have to do? They had to exercise faith. God said, when you get bit, just look at the pole. Just look at the serpent on the pole, and you will live. Now, if somebody decided not to look, guess what? He was going to die. But the serpent was on the ball. It was there. All you got to do is, by faith, look at it. They had to exercise faith. And that, my friends, is our situation today. You see, we are born with the venom of sin inside of us. And we can use all the positive mental attitude you want, but you're going to take care of it. Okay? You can read the Bible all you want, and it's not going to take care of it. We are all condemned to die. But there is a cure. But the cure is not within us. See, the cure is to look at our serpent, at Jesus on the cross, who became our serpent for us. The Bible says that he became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is the good news, my friends. Yes, you have the venom of sin within your body. Yes, you are condemned to die. If you look at verse 17, he's going to say, I didn't come to condemn the world because the world's already condemned. But what we got to look, do is look at Jesus on the pole. He said it this way in verse 16, which everybody knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You don't need to perish today. You don't need to be separated from God. And you don't need to be a better person to be accepted. You need to look to Jesus. He already lived the life for you. He lived the perfect life. He followed every commandment. He is accepted by the Father. And he was accepted as the perfect sacrifice for you and for me. I want to finish reading a, a conversion story. This is the story of Charles Spurgeon. Many of you are familiar with him. And he wrote that in January 6, 19, 1850, I'm sorry, when he was 15 years old, this is his words, and I'm going to read it for you because I don't want to really mess it up. 
says, I sometimes think I might have been in darkness and despair now had it not been for the goodness of God in sending a snowstorm on Sunday morning when I was going to a place of worship. When I could go no further, I turned down a court and came to a little primitive Methodist chapel. In that chapel, there might have been a dozen or 15 people. The minister did not come that morning, snowed up, I suppose. A poor man, a shoemaker, a tailor, or something of that sort, went up into the pulpit to preach. He was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had nothing else to say. The text was, look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, in Isaiah 45, 22. He did not even pronounce the words rightly, but that did not matter. There was, I thought, a glimpse of hope for me in this text. So he began thus saying, my dear friends, this is a very simple text indeed. It says, look. Now, that does not take a great deal of effort. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It just look. Well, a man need not go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool, and yes, you can look. A man need not be worth a thousand a year to look. Anyone can look. A child can look. But then the text says, look unto me. Many of you are looking to yourselves, but it's, it's, it's no use looking there. You will never find any comfort in yourselves. Some look to God the Father. No, look to him by and by. Jesus Christ said, look unto me. Some of you said, we may wait the Spirit's working. You have no business with that just now. Look to Christ. The text says, look unto me. Then the good man followed up his text in this way. Look unto me. I'm sweating great drops of blood. Look unto me. I'm hanging on the cross. Look, I'm dead and buried. Look unto me, I rise again. Look unto me, I ascend. I am sitting at the Father's right hand. Oh, look to me, look to me. When he had got about that length and he managed to spin out 10 minutes, he was at the length of his tether. Then he looked at me under the gallery and there say, with so few people he knew that I, to be a stranger. He then said, young man, you look very miserable. Well, I did, but I had not been accustomed to have remarks made on my personal appearance from the pulpit. However, it was a good blow struck. And he continued, and you will always be miserable. Miserable in life and miserable in death if you don't obey my text. But if you obey now, this moment, you will be saved. Then he shouted as only a primitive Methodist can. Young man, look to Jesus Christ. Then and there, the cloud was gone. The darkness had rolled away. In that moment, I saw the sun. I could have risen that moment and sung with the most enthusiastic of them of the precious blood of Christ. Well, that is our message this morning. That is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look unto me and be ye saved. Anything else we try to do is just religion. So, man, this morning, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, if maybe you've been trying to be very good, and maybe you are a good person in our eyes. Maybe you're almost like Nicodemus. You know your word. You, you've read it many times. You study it. You know it better than, than I do. Hey, that's fine. That's not going to get you to heaven. It's not pleasing God. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you will have access to the kingdom of God. Then, let's read and study the word. Then, let's obey the word because we love him so much that we will obey him. But the first step, the first thing you need to do 
Let's look unto Jesus. Would you stand with me tonight, this morning? If you will close your eyes and bow your heads and I want to ask you to pray. Pray for those who don't know Christ in your life, that they will look unto him. That because they know you, we will guide them to look at Jesus Christ. And especially pray for those that are playing religion. Those that really think they're acceptable to God on their own because of their own merits. Pray for them. That they will come to understand that all they need to do is look unto him. Is to look to Jesus Christ for salvation. Would you pray this morning? Lord God, Father, as we gather together here, Lord, we know. We know that there's some in this church and many churches around Broward County in our city that do not know you as their Lord and Savior, Father. And Father, we, this morning we want to understand, we want them to understand that the only thing we need to do is accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We don't need to be better. We don't need to get better. We don't need to learn more. We need to submit and accept. And Father, once they do that, just like Dr. Spurgeon, the light will be on, the eyes will be open, and they will be able to see the beauty of your love. Thank you for loving us so much and demonstrating that love by dying for us. Thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ to die and to pay our price for our sin. Oh, Father, transform us this morning by the power of your word and the work of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.